You're listening to the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast, a place for sex addicts to share their experiences of recovery, to help break the stigma, myths, and misconceptions of sex addiction. This podcast may contain topics of sexuality, sexual trauma, dysfunction, or other things that may be triggering. So listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast. My name is Jason, I'm a sex addict, and I will be your podcast host for today. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to episode number 96 of the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast. In this week, we will be continuing our tradition study, covering traditions 7, 8, and 9. Back in episode number 81, we did traditions 1, 2, and 3. And in episode 86, we covered traditions 4, 5, and 6. And we'll be wrapping up the tradition study in July or August. And so since we were talking about the traditions in this episode, I selected a reading from Voices of Recovery, and this comes from March 19th on page 79. The opening quote, Sex Addicts Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. And that comes from the Green Book on page 89. Tradition 8 gives me freedom. In my professional life, I have developed skills, knowledge, and experience. Unfortunately, I have also developed a lot of pride in my work and feel most confident when I am living from that part of myself. My shame led me to hide behind my professionalism, even when I was involved in things that are not part of my work. I bonded much of my identity to my work. I wanted to hide behind my professionalism in SAA, too. Of course, I had no real experience, knowledge, or skill with recovery at first, so I tried to fake it. I wanted to be a professional SAA recovering person, whatever that is. Through Tradition 8, I realized that my approach was wrong. Hiding behind my image actually limited me. I needed to be an SAA rookie and an SAA seeker. I had to be open. This tradition freed me from the straitjacket of my false pride. It also freed me to live a new way. I can be vulnerable. I can admit that I do not know everything and do not have to. And I can let other people lead. I can let whatever skills, knowledge, and experience I have developed serve others rather than serve my ego. In the meditation at the end, the non-professionalism of the program offers me freedom from my false identity and freedom to discover the real me. Yeah, I really enjoyed that reading. Although we talked about a lot of different aspects of Tradition 8, I really loved in this reading talking about letting go of the perfectionism, hiding behind trying to be a professional, and allowing for the freedom of recovery to take over. So since I'm recording this later in the week than I usually do, I'm going to keep the intro pretty short. Got some emails to read at the end of this episode. In this group recording, we had Darren and Ted. A few of the other guys that were on the previous episodes couldn't make it, and we talk about that in the recording. Without further ado, I'm ready to turn it over to the tradition study covering traditions 7, 8, and 9. Here it is. I hope you enjoy it. Well, welcome, guys. We are going to continue our tradition study, and this group tonight is a bit smaller than our previous ones. A couple of the guys couldn't join us here, but we do have Darren and Ted, and I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. Hey, Jason. Darren F. here, Recovered Sex Addict from McKinney, Texas. Great to be here again to discuss Tradition 7, 8, and 9 tonight. Thanks, Darren. How about you, Ted? Hey, good evening, Jason Ted S. from Gratefully Recovered Sex Addict from McKinney, Texas as well. Grateful to be here. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, we did have Bob on the call shortly before we started recording. Yeah, he may join us. The audio quality wasn't that great. And uh, did you say Eric might be joining late? Eric M., who was on the previous call, he might be joining late too. Okay. We'll see. Keep an eye out for him. 
yeah, and a couple of the other guys could not make it, but I am really grateful to be able to continue this. It's been a while since we've uh, done one of these, but Darren, I'll have you kind of be the ringleader here. We're each going to take turns in terms of the readings of the traditions, since there's just a couple of us, but I'll yeah. uh, have you kind of lead the discussion on each. Thanks, Jason. And um, yeah, I was looking at the history of our of the tradition series and it looks like we're uh, episode 81 86 and i know you're now into the upper 90s yeah this will you, be with your episode so this will be somewhere up that, there so for the 96 96 okay so for the for the listeners join us now look for uh, 81 and 86 and then uh, you'll be able to get all caught up with uh, the history of this so yeah so tonight the uh, tradition uh, 7 8 and 9 and i've asked ted to read the long and the short form of Tradition 7. Thanks, Darren. Ted S. Uh, long form, our SAA experience has taught us that the SAA groups themselves ought to be fully supported by the voluntary contributions of their own members. We think that each group should soon achieve this ideal, that any public solicitation of funds using the name of SAA is highly dangerous, whether by groups, clubs, hospitals, or other outside agencies, that acceptance of large gifts from any source or contributions carrying any obligation, whatever, is unwise. Then, too, we view with much concern those SAA treasuries which continue beyond prudent reserves to accumulate funds for not stated SAA purpose. Experience has often warned us that Nothing can so surely destroy our spiritual heritage as futile disputes over property, money, and authority. The short form states every SAA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. Thanks, Ted. Yeah, of course. So for me, I'll just jump right in. This tradition is often thought of as the money tradition. And while it's certainly an important aspect of the tradition, there's also other ways that we can contribute. There's other ways that we can be of service um, that don't involve money. Our shares, our time, our service are all ways that we can contribute to the health and the wellness of the group um, outside of just cash flow. Yeah, in the green book on page 88, kind of the middle of the page, it's, it, it talks about, right? It talks about that uh, being the money tradition. You know, so does it take a lot of money to carry the SA message? I think the answer is no, but it might take some, right? And, mm-hmm. um, you know, so there's... There, yeah, meeting you know, places have, aren't free. Right? Yeah. You, you know, if if you're given a place to meet for free, well, that's that's great. But we do have to be mindful of that because that could imply, uh, hey, hey, we're not charging you for rent here. So we got, we need you to come here on the weekend and clean up the place. Can you do that? You know, you know but if we pay rent for our place, we're not going to feel obliged to do something extra because we're getting a free ride, so to mm-hmm. speak. So yeah. What are some of the other things that we need money for in SA typically? So for the new man that walks in, we need books, perhaps we also need chips um, for you know, birthdays and timelines and anniversaries, yeah. um, any literature website, you know, zoom costs, technology costs are, are other things that come to mind. Yeah. Yeah, what one of the things I was thinking of is one of our meetings. I remember we got a space at a hospital and they didn't charge us rent. And mm. one of the things that we brought up was this tradition, uh, seeing that as an outside contribution. And so we did make sure that uh, even though we weren't paying rent, that we took some collection and gave it to the hospital. So we're not getting this room for free. And just wanting to stay on the up and up. Yeah, because if we take that money or that free offer for something, we might feel obligated to to do something, which mm-hmm. will then dis- distract us from, again, what Tradition 5 says is our primary purpose, right? So, you know, I was going to do some step work with someone on Saturday morning, but uh, the, the the place called and said we have to come up and clean up the place. So, so I'm mm-hmm. not going to be able to carry a message. I got to go feel obligated to go do this other purpose. Mm-hmm. Right? So that, this, this tradition prevents us from being distracted from that, that primary purpose, certainly. Yeah. One of the other things I thought about, especially during times of financial crisis for myself, even though you know I'm contributing a small amount per week, uh, there were 
times where I didn't have extra cash on hand, but you know, I would look at other ways that I can contribute to the group and the the service work. You know, I mm-hmm. was doing uh intergroup work and at the time before Zoom, I was actually spending half of my day doing uh meetings and then going to intergroup uh, which was 50 miles away and then uh driving back from that and so the money and time that i put into service was my contribution for the weeks that i couldn't donate money to the basket yeah ted can we tell people that they have to donate are you going to confront the new person and go hey i noticed you didn't put two dollars in the basket is that a healthy response in <laughs> SA? <laughs> no no probably not you know i um i try to lead by example you know personally and, and let the guys that i sponsor know what i do and it kind of compels them to maybe you know look to not only the leadership of their sponsor but other men in the room and feel compelled to do the same you know I, i'm reminded when you when you find recovery and you've had that spiritual awakening, you want to give back, you know, it's, it, it's, it kind of goes with that faith without works is dead. If, if you don't feel the joy of recovery, is it really recovery? Is it real? Right. I mean, it, if you don't feel the, the thankfulness and the gratitude and the humility and want to share that not only in your service and volunteering, and it can't be the same guys that are volunteering every meeting. We need to have some, some new guys raise their hand and, and volunteer as well. But yeah, I feel like there's guys around the table that see guys donating um, and continuing to do that. Maybe they're, they'll feel compelled to do the same. But, but I can suggest nicely to any of my protégés that I'm working with, if I see that they're not, I can ask them about it. Um, I don't need to call them out in front of the whole group, um, but I can certainly ask them about it, maybe one-on-one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that. It's uh, you know, I think when someone asks us to... Uh, sponsor and they kind of give us carte blanche to right. get involved in their life right you know and to challenge them to poke them but i love what you said ted about being an example right if i'm not giving my two dollars i can't i can't ask you know the mm. man i sponsor to be given two bucks and um <clears throat> you know we all come here with different means different capabilities and different mm. seasons of life and you know if you just lost your job yeah don't don't give money i'll i'll give some money for you because my job's going great you know and <clears throat> and it feels good to support that what do you think about the, again, is a healthy group where a couple of people are given a lot or a whole bunch of people are given a little? What do, what do we want to strive for, do you think? I like the picture of the balanced scoring attack. I don't think that it should be, you know, because then it's lopsided in terms of if a couple of people are carrying the group with their financial donation, then I think pride gets involved. I think it becomes a situation of, well, I'm the one giving all of the money to the group. And you feel like, that you're owed something perhaps, right? I, I, I would rather yeah. have many guys across the room donating a little bit than two guys carrying the group in, in mm. my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. I, I certainly agree with that. You know, our ego will get in the way and mm. we'll start to think that we're special members because do you, you know how much I give? I'm VIP. You know? <laughs> right. Let me, let me see that treasury report. You got my name next to all my donations? Let me show right. you that. You know? but yeah, By at the top of the list. Lack of humility. But uh uh, yeah, I'm just reminded we just need many pillars of support, and it goes so much further than financial contributions. Uh, you know, when when it's a group a asks for a volunteer to do something, and I don't hear any response, it makes me wonder what why aren't we hearing a response to that offer to be of service? You mm-hmm. know, what's what's going on, right? We have 50 people in the room, and it's crickets when say, hey, we need a volunteer to do this next week. And it's crickets, I, right? It's I, like, think, I, th- I think I think what's going on? I think initially, Darren, because I've thought about this many times, because that does happen uh, mm-hmm. from time to time. Mm-hmm. I, I think initially, it's some of the folks, as I was saying a moment ago, are giving others a chance. So I think that there's times where the ten or twenty percent that typically raise their hand and volunteer for those roles are giving others an opportunity. Um, right, and we need to do that. Right. You know, so um, I, I'm okay with the uncomfortable silence at times because mm-hmm. I want somebody to feel like, man, I really, I, I haven't volunteered. I really should. Right. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah. One of the things at our business meetings, when we do service rotations, 
I, I can remember a time where we would do this after the meeting was over and, and anyone that wanted to stick around for the business meeting uh, would then throw their hat uh, into the ring for, for whatever uh, positions came up. And it seemed to be the same people over and over and mm. over. And so what we did is moved the uh, service rotations into the regular portion of the meeting and having that uncomfortable silence uh, when different positions were up. But one of the things that we took to reading is um, the bottom of page 88, top of 89 of the green book. Being fully self-supporting means being aware of the responsibility of every member for supporting the group. Some of us have a natural tendency to sit back and let others do all the work. Others are all too willing to take on service positions and hold them indefinitely. Although this might create a perfect balance between those who those who take over and those who sit back, in actuality, such a situation works against becoming self-supporting. And so we were seeing the, the same people raising their hands over and over, uh, basically swapping positions. And by reading that, we let people know that, hey, yes, we need new blood. And we're currently going through this uh, at our inner group having the same people that are are doing service and uh PICPC uh we're we're missing a coordinator for that because right. uh we're not getting enough new blood involved in volunteering for for new positions so mm-hmm. yeah i think it's important that new people do step up i i hit service burnout at one point where i was doing so like two or three service positions at a couple of different meetings. Mm. And I finally said, if you guys want this meeting to continue, someone <laughs> needs to step yep, up uh, because I'm sure. not going to be doing it anymore. Sure. Yeah. So that's true. a healthy, that's a healthy response, Jason. That's, that's what we ought to do. Right. Cause uh, if I just keep doing it, I think that speaks to self-will, right. I'm just going to do it. Cause I want this, right. It's, that's been resentment. Just, that's mm-hmm. more about my desire than I think God's sure. God's will, right? You know, it's um, I think sometimes God speaks through money and speaks through service, right? If if sure. someone shows up to do anything, I, I guess we're not going to do it, right? If there's if the money doesn't show up to accomplish some goal, I guess we're, we're not going to buy the technology. We're not going to have the retreat. We're you know, so mm-hmm. um, yeah, you know, and we and if I'm spiritually healthy, I'll be okay with that. And understand that, not not self will it and. All of a sudden, yeah. I'm going to donate a thousand bucks to make something happen because I want it to happen. Yeah, I want to touch on a couple of things that the uh, long form just mentions. It, mm-hmm. it talks about having a uh, uh, not not um, uh, holding on to large sums of money, right? Yeah, yeah. Reserves. yeah. Reserves. You know, let me ask you the question: Is it easier to decide what to do with five bucks compared to five hundred bucks? You know, if if your group or an inner group has all this money. It's like, hey, we got five bucks. What do you want to do with it? The decision is probably easier than, hey, we got 500 bucks. What do you want to do with it? Sure. And if there's no stated purpose, we're going to sit there and argue and, oh, we should do this. And I think we should do that. And this person wants to do this. And, you know, and so the this tradition is telling us, hey, before you get a whole bunch of money, ha- decide what you're going to do with it. Hey, we're going to mm-hmm. do a deposit on the retreat. We're going to buy this piece of technology for a hybrid meeting. We're going to... You know, we're going to donate money to this, this, and this. ISO. Mm-hmm. ISO, maybe intergroup, um, mm-hmm. you know, that we're going to pay rent, right? And so there should be a whole lot of money in our treasury. If there is, that's kind of a violation of this tradition. We're not really mm-hmm. honoring that. And because um, it, it, it tells us nothing will, will surely destroy our spiritual heritage as fuel disputes over, over that stuff. Property, money, authority. So, yeah. so let's... Let's take a vow of poverty. We don't need much money to carry this message. We got to pay the rent. We're going to donate. We're going to buy some chips. We're going to buy some books. Other than that, hey, let's donate it. Yeah, we ran into this during the pandemic. A lot of the the meetings had a collected treasury. And when we went to Zoom, we weren't obviously passing the basket. And eventually when those meetings returned, and the treasury returned, there was this large sum of, sum of money that hadn't been properly dispersed to intergroup or ISO. Uh-huh. And so meetings are with fresh treasurers 
don't quite know what to do with that. And they asked me, you know, what should we do with this money? We typically do a uh, 60-40 split, 60%, I think, to intergroup and then 40 to the ISO. And so just say two months rent for prudent reserve, uh, any literature that we need to buy, make sure we've got the funds, uh, chips and medallions. And beyond that, we don't really need to have all that that money on hand. So please give it to uh, other places that are waiting for that, like the ISO. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the ISO has the Lifeline program mm-hmm. where you know, you can sign up to get money out of your bank account on a regular monthly basis or recurring basis. And that's very helpful. You know, groups can do that. Individuals can do that. But uh, yeah, that's the whole seven tradition thing. Um, they do need some money, right? It does mm-hmm. take some money to operate Sex Addicts Anonymous, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Hey, well, let's finish up this one with just some common pitfalls. and We'll move on to number eight, I think. Okay. So a couple of things I, I've got here, some common pitfalls, not understanding all the different ways members can contribute to the group, right? Mm -hmm. And so if I don't inform the new person what they can do to be of service, (coughs) hey, you can be a greeter, you can do their open and close reading, or you can do these other readings and and explain the other service positions, treasury, secretary, those kinds of things. That's that's our job to the newcomer to do that. Otherwise, I I don't know. And I think that I don't know that I can serve when I show up. So uh, having lots of opportunities for everybody, no matter if you're new or old, to serve is a great thing. Not having enough pillars of service. We talked about that, just having a few a few givers. Uh, but when those givers aren't, aren't there, we don't know how to have a meeting. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. The person who always runs the meeting doesn't show up and we don't, the people that are there don't know how to run the meeting. That's like, not so good. Not talking about what the money is used for, right? Well, why why would I give two bucks, right? Where does it go, right? And so if we're not talking about the the reasons for that, you know, that might prevent people from giving. Uh, is the money going to a place that can help carry the SA message? Uh, not receiving updates on the status of the treasury. So we want sure. to get oh, yeah. reports yeah. during the business meetings from our treasurer, mm-hmm. you know, just communication, communication, collecting money without a stated purpose, Kind of talked about that one. A uh, few people giving a lot instead of a lot giving a little. We talked about that as well. Any other common pitfalls before we move on, guys? That, or any other parting shots on number seven? Yeah, just like you mentioned, the update on the state of the treasury. There has mm. been times where a trusted servant has left the program and <laughs> this has happened with our literature and we with our literature we had a kitty of of money available there and that disappeared for about eight months and so trying to keep regular status on where the money is and what it's being used for is an important thing yeah yeah i like this term you know of of the new guy or really any guy becoming a tourist in our meetings right Mm -hmm. um i think you know it kind of goes back to that idea of the new man doesn't know what it's like to be recovered, but a recovered guy knows what it feels like to be new and the importance of being useful. I know for me, recovery meant usefulness again, purpose. You know, I remember coming in early, early months, early weeks, and guys that had been around a while that I looked up to, Vaughn told me, and I felt like uh, I was needed. I felt um, like I was contributing to the group that day, um, and it felt good. And, and I, I, I've never forgotten that. So um, I always, you know, try to raise my hand and, and volunteer for something. But uh, at the same time, I think it's extremely important to give that the new guy that same opportunity to feel usefulness as I had. Yeah. Awesome. It's critical, critical. I got to be a greeter today. <laughs> you know, that's, that's yes. the highlight of our day, right? It's like, oh, yes. my God, I met a new person who was walking in the door. You know, we don't want to rob anybody of that opportunity. I, I want to, I'll do it every meeting because I love it, right? but but that's not fair for the other person. Right. Who gets to experience that. So, you know, we rotate service positions for that reason. Mm-hmm. Trish was talking about mm-hmm. that. The last thing, page 165 of the 12 and 12, because we also use the 12 and 12 here mm-hmm. To, mm-hmm. to learn about the traditions. I don't think we quoted anything on this one, but I was looking on 165. It says that at that moment, we believe the principle of corporate poverty was firmly and finally embedded in the, the AA tradition, the SA tradition, right? You know, we take a vow of poverty, really. 
mm. um, because we don't want to ruin what we got with disputes over money and property and authority, prestige, all these types of things. So, exactly. all right. You know, again, I'm reminded that I come into Sex Addicts Anonymous as a self-centered taker, mm. and, I, and I and I and I leave a, a grateful giver. So again, every time I go to a meeting today, I'm happy to get my two bucks out and drop it in the hat. And you know, if I forget, I can get on PayPal and and deliver it that way mm. to my to my home group. So one other method. All right. Well, I'll read Tradition Eight. Long and short of that one. Let's see in my little guide here. Um, the long form of number eight. Our essay experience has taught us that. Sex Addicts Anonymous should remain forever non-professional. We define professionalism as the occupation of counseling sex addicts for fees or higher, but we may employ sex addicts where they are going to perform those services for which we might otherwise have to engage non-sex addicts. Such special services may be well recompensed, but our usual SA 12-step work is never to be paid for. In the short form, and again, I'm reminded we always start with uh, our SA experience has taught us that SA should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. Yeah, um, you know, for me, this this tradition is uh, what I like to say is the great equalizer. We're all the same in Sex Addicts Anonymous. Mm. Uh, we're, we, we have a common problem. We have a common solution. We have a common program that leads us from the, the, the problem to the solution. And what you do outside the Sex Addicts Anonymous meeting is, I don't care. It's none of our business, right? I don't need to know. You don't need to tell me. Um, sometimes we do learn what people do outside of Sex Addicts Anonymous, but, uh, but if you're talking about what you do in terms of maybe your professional work and helping sex yeah. addicts for, for fee in a Sex Addicts Anonymous meeting, it might be a little contrary to this tradition. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I like what it says. Uh, you know, if you look at the, the 12 and 12 in the, the first paragraph, it says, we freely eat ye have received and freely give, right? So mm -hmm. this idea, this idea that I could charge for a fifth step, right? Or or any amount of 12-step work that I do is just ridiculous, right? That would ruin my ability to be useful, ruin my ability to be helpful. Right? What else? Yeah, I think it's important when we have people that are uh that work as therapists uh mm -hmm. and uh work yes. as uh life coaches and and things you know those are awesome but when we come into the rooms we need to make sure that all that drops away and that person doesn't have any status higher or lower than anyone else in the room that mm -hmm. we're all yeah. we're all the same uh, i know of a few ceos from companies that are in my rooms, but as soon as they cross that threshold, they're just another sex addict. And mm. I really, really love that, that there's no, <laughs> no status in what yeah. people do outside of the meetings. Yeah. You, you know, I will say there are times when uh, your gifts in terms of service or your, what you do for your vocation can be extremely helpful to the organization mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of service. I think of, you know, people that work on the internet, right? Folks that support our websites and, and support the information that's out there. I can't do that personally, but there's, there's guys thankfully that can, and they're gifted at that and they give of their time and they donate that. Uh, I think that's fantastic. I, I do like your point, Jason, that when we all come into these rooms, we're all the same. There's no hierarchy. It's one-on-one, -on -one, one man giving to another man, sharing his experiences with the solution. That's it. It's really very simple. And you want to give back because you can't keep the gold for yourself. As it says in the blue book, you have to give it away in order to keep it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. There's not some extra special school, some other program I have to get qualified to do to be able to help the next new person who walks in the room, right? I, if I've had the experience of a spiritual awakening as a result mm. of the steps, mm -hmm. I'm uniquely qualified, right? If I'm a sex addict and I've had a spiritual awakening, I'm uniquely qualified to help the next sex addict mm -hmm. who walks in the door asking for help. And it doesn't matter what I do outside of Sex Addicts Anonymous. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and um, I also need to be, you know, because I, I can put certain people, if I know what you do, I can have a tendency to put you on a pedestal, like, oh my gosh, well, you know, Ted does this outside of work, you know, so I'm going to, I'm going to really make sure I emphasize what Ted has to say and how Ted shares and mm. 
I'm going to mention Ted's name. Oh my God, Ted, that was just a wonderful share. Thank you. You know, and um, it, I can put, you know, through my own shortcomings, people on a pedestal, you know, based on maybe what they do or whatever. Um, and I need to not do that. We need to be careful as a fellowship in our meetings to, to not emphasize that or to put someone on a pedestal, even if they're not, mm-hmm. other people can do it. And so we need to not do it. Every time I hear my name in a meeting, my head gets a little bit bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's not a mm-hmm. good thing, right? So if, so if I hear Darren in a meeting, that's not good for my spiritual condition, right? It's not about me. You know, it's about the, the principles that we're talking mm-hmm. about. It's about it's about the message that we're carrying, not about the personality, right? Exactly. Um, yeah, I love this green book quote on page 89. As members of SAA, we share a common problem and a common solution. We gratefully give what was so freely given to us, and there's no price tag on such a gift Again, I love the saying, you know, faith without works is dead. I don't sit there and be silent and be a tourist. I I can't help but be helpful. I can't help but want to be helpful. I can't help but want to give the gift that was given to me uh, freely to that man that's still suffering because I know how good it feels to find recovery and to find freedom from sex addiction. And that individual doesn't know what that feels like yet. And I feel like it's an honor if I walk with that individual through his journey uh, to freedom. So it's an incredible gift and and one that I honor every time I work with someone. Yeah, yeah. just thinking about the the price tag on carrying the message that that has come up for me uh, doing this podcast. People mm. wanting to give me extra money for the the service work that I do. And it's like, no, I am carrying the message. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do ask for money from Intergroup that we've allocated in our budget for the podcast hosting and the Zoom costs and, and mm-hmm. things like, like that. But yeah, I'm not being paid for, for doing this. I, I put a lot of hours into it, but it is, uh, like was mentioned, is... You know, I never really did this as a, a, a paid job, but you know, I've been working with editing audio for decades. And one of my first bits of service that I did for my group was to help convert the audio cassette tapes that we had of SAA talks and convert them to CDs and eventually MP3s and I've used that ability to work here on this podcast and I am so glad that I'm not being compensated for something like this because I'm giving away what I was freely given Mm. love sharing the message for free and for fun. I'm having fun. I don't know about you guys. Mm -hmm. The, um, what comes to mind? Um, I I love the alliteration at the end of the long form, such special services, right? (laughs) Maybe well recompensed. So there are people in Sex Addicts Anonymous that are being paid mm-hmm. to, yeah. to work for Sex Addicts Anonymous, right? I don't sure. know if everyone knows that. You know, some of the listeners might not be aware of that, right? But we've got a director, right? We've got office staff in Houston. Mm-hmm. Uh, we So, you know, those people manage websites, return calls, return thousands of emails, you know, on a monthly basis. And um, yeah, you know, they, among other things, right? Mail out literature, mail out all this stuff. Again, we don't need to get into all the details here, but we're so thankful for that. And and they deserve to be paid. Just like with our home group, right? If if we want to, or the inner group, they want to create a website and, you know, someone in the inner group knows how to create a website. Mm-hmm. We can give them some money because otherwise we'd have to pay someone outside of six items to create the website mm-hmm. that we want. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's no, this tradition says, hey, that's all right. Right. That person's doing service work. They're being compensated for that, that work. They don't have to be, but we can, right? It seems like in the early days of A, there were some issues around this, right? People getting mad that, oh, that person's being paid to to carry this message. Well, someone's got to do it, right? If we don't have someone answer the phone, we're not going to be as effective as we could be. So mm-hmm. um, I don't I don't see that much in Sex Addicts Anonymous today. You know, I don't think people are irritated that that we pay our our director, right? <laughs> I haven't heard mm-hmm. that, you know. But uh, but again, this tradition says, hey, no. We, we, we can do that. We ought to do that. But there's a difference between service work and 12-step work. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, absolutely. And we, need to, we need to not confuse that, right? So I can't just do service work at the expense of not doing 12-step work. And for me, I think what that means 
is 12 step work is kind of carrying the message directly, kind of talking to the newcomer, helping the newcomer get connected, you know, whether it's temporary sponsorship or could lead to, to full-time sponsorship of taking someone through the 12 steps. So that's 12 step service work. Again, showing up early, setting up the chairs, picking up the trash, setting that literature, answering the phone, right. Doing this podcast, right. You know, mm-hmm. service work, the ISO director, right. I know her, right. She, mm-hmm. in addition to the work she does, she also sponsors people, mm-hmm. you know, because she knows that in order for me to stay, stay sober, I need to do 12 step work also, you know, and so I can't use the excuse. Oh, I'm doing service work at the expense of doing 12 step work. Service work makes 12 step work possible. I mm-hmm. need someone to set up the chairs so that the meeting is ready when we all show up, that we're going to be more effective in carrying that message. Yeah. In addition to sponsoring people, helping out newcomers find uh, information about various aspects of the program, whether it's finding the pamphlets and and literature or other various resources that are available, answering general questions. Like when we, we get a lot of newcomers coming into these meetings and having a clue of what the program is, what are the steps we get into the, the God aspect of, you know, finding a higher power and just being able to relate that to uh, newcomers as they're coming in and, and help guide people, you know, through that. And Uh yeah, that is, uh, I do that in, in addition to sponsoring people and being a temporary sponsor for others. But uh, there was a time where I was, letting my service work get in the way of helping out other newcomers. And that didn't work out too well. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, we have to find that healthy balance, right? Mm. Um, some of us love to serve, you know, but again, we can't, we can't forget our primary purpose, which isn't to be the treasurer, which isn't to be the secretary of the meeting or to email the phone list out. That's important and it's useful, <clears throat> <clears throat> but it's not my primary purpose, right? My primary purpose is to go, hey, let me let me help you understand what the disease of sex addiction is. Mm-hmm. And if you admit that that's what you got, you want me to help you? I can help you if you want to get well. I've got a solution that works for me. Mm-hmm. Let's let's go, right? Step one, step two, step three, all right? And you know now 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 that person's able to be a service. Now they can take over my secretary role, so that I'm now I'm not as obligated with that. So now I can sponsor more people. You know, and it just kind of grows from there, right? It's just we keep passing it on and we rotate for that reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Common pitfalls was tradition eight here. What did I write down? Putting members on a pedestal. We talked about mm-hmm. that because of what mm-hmm. they do outside. Yeah, we don't want to do that. I don't care if you're the founder, right? And a lot of the people know who the founder of Sex Addicts Anonymous is. Stories in the Green Book, story number one, right? If that person were to walk into a Sex Addicts Anonymous meeting, Okay, you're just a sex addict, right? Mm. You know, even if you authored a bunch of books about sex addiction, you're you're just another knucklehead like me, right? Are you, mm-hmm. You're either seeking the solution and helping others, or or you're not. I, I don't know. Not understanding that the ISO is also a business entity and has paid staff. Mm-hmm. And we talked about that. If you are a professional or, or pretending to be something special, not taking off that hat when coming into SA meeting. Right. That's that's not a, helpful to the meeting or when working with sponsees that you're pretending to be, you know, something special, uh, making carrying our message more difficult than it needs to be by adding a bunch of non 12 step stuff to the process. You know, and that comes, you know, oftentimes I've you know, I've been to therapy, you know, I've sat for many hours and years with therapists and mm-hmm. men's groups and other outside things. And I've been to church and, you know, I've got some cool stuff in my head. Right. But that's different than 12 step. It's Mm -hmm. different purposes, different reasons, different program. And so I'm not going to make a sponsee go, hey, I just came back from this treatment center and here's all these worksheets. And I just Mm -hmm. came back from the church program and here's all these things you need to read. And so we can overcomplicate it based on our unique experience. But I don't know if it'll be helpful to him. Let's just keep it focused on the 12 steps. Mm -hmm. And And if it leads to something more after that, hey, great. Lifetime of fun. But but we can overcomplicate it based on my experience of having a whole lot of professional help sometimes, right? Yeah, yeah. I was really curious when I was reading the the notes for this and was wondering what your thoughts on that were. So thank you for clarifying that. Is yeah, that makes sense. It's easy to do, you know, because like Darren said, 
as a part of recovery, we've all been to a lot of things, a lot of groups, a lot of outside entities, but they're outside entities. And um, when you start trying to layer that into um, sponsoring and, and sharing and carrying the message, it really makes things very complicated and very convoluted. Um, it, simple, not easy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we need to stick to what it is. It worked for me. Yeah. I, I don't know about you guys, but I've been told to read books and I've gotten those books and started reading them. And I felt like I needed to have some kind of degree to, to really <laughs> understand and, and practically do what the exercise was telling me to do. I'm like, mm-hmm. Holy cow, this is going to take forever. And I, okay, you know, but we, I've got a book, right? Sex Addicts Anonymous. Isn't that enough to recover, right? Mm-hmm. I've got a 12 step book. Maybe it's the big book. Maybe it's this, the, the, the Sex Addicts Anonymous book. And maybe we, we talk about the 12 and 12 a little bit. Isn't mm-hmm. that enough? Do I need to make it more complicated? I give you more stuff to do? I, I don't know. Again, this is just my experience. You might disagree, the readers out there. But uh, again, let's, let's keep it simple. All right. Anything else on Tradition 8, folks? No, we, no, we got to be careful of the time for Jason. I know he said yeah. he needed to. Yeah. All right, J- Jason, let's hear number nine. What do you got? On the sure show? thing. The long form. Our SAA experience has taught us that each SAA group needs the least possible organization. Rotating leadership is the best. The small group may elect its secretary, the large group its rotating committee, In the groups of a large metropolitan area, their central or intergroup committee, which often employs a full-time secretary. The trustees of the ISO board are, in effect, our SAA general service committee. Uh, Again, we're we're paraphrasing here. Uh, They are the custodians of our SAA tradition and the receivers of voluntary SAA contributions by which we maintain our SAA International Service Organization office at Houston. They are authorized by the groups to handle our overall public relations. The Literature Committee guarantees the integrity of our principal newspaper, The Outer Circle, and all other SAA literature. All such representatives are to be guided in the spirit of service, For true leaders in SAA are but trusted servants and experienced servants of the whole. They derive no real authority from their titles. They do not govern. Universal respect is the key to their usefulness. And the short form is SAA as such ought never be organized, but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. Thanks, Jason. We gave you the longest one. Woo! (laughs) We talked about paraphrasing that long form because, uh, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous has a slightly different structure and we mm-hmm. tried to change some of the language to match ours, but it still doesn't do it. But but there's a lot to that long form that the short form just kind of misses a little bit. Yeah. So, you know, it's important to read that and to, to look at that. But anyway, what are your what are your thoughts, Jason? <laughs> just re- real quickly, right off the bat, one of the, the jokes that we always have is when we're trying to find something can't can't figure it out. Someone's asking the secretary of a meeting, Hey, do you remember how we did this or, or whatever? And we always come back with, well, SAA ought never be organized. (laughs) So we, we joke (laughs) around with that one, but yeah, I love this tradition talking about the fact that these, all the people in service, and this goes back to the earlier, earlier traditions that, we do not govern in these positions of being a trusted servant. Yeah. And that, and like I was mentioning earlier, that the rotation of service. And so uh, I was just talking to one of my friends who's just started up a brand new meeting here in the Bay area and that some people will start a meeting and it becomes their meeting and they hold mm. on to that and without the regular rotation of service, a lot of things can get lost and we start to come up with our own rules and, and things like that. And so having this in place allows us to make sure that fresh blood is getting in here. New ideas are, mm. are coming through. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I like I like this tradition as well for the fact that, you know, when you're a part of SAA for a while, you start to see various organizations 
formed and you start to understand why they're there. You know, PICPC or, um, you know, the, the, the National Conference and, and, you know, setting those committees up are extremely important so that the right message is being carried, that we're all not all out here doing our own thing and saying something that's uh, holistically different than some other group, right? Um, if it flows through one committee and they have um, the opportunity to provide um, input or motions that all of us get to have a voice into, that's great. But if we're all out here trying to do something different, that self-serving, it's going to go against this tradition and really against these organizations are, which are set up for the greater good of SAA and making sure that um, we have the right information and we are carrying the appropriate message. Yeah, for sure. I, I've been accused of being too organized at times, you know, so the, the idea that you wouldn't have minutes to remind us just annoys, mm-hmm. annoys me that no way. What do you mean you didn't copy that? How do we not know, right? <clears throat> I think it's a different level of organization, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I think here with this tradition, we're talking about structure, organizational structure as opposed yeah. to as opposed to starting the meeting on time. Mm. Right? That's, a form, that's a form of being organized, right? If we never started the meeting, when does the meeting start? I don't know. It would be hard to be as effective as we could be, right? So we need a minimal amount of organization on, on both mm-hmm. levels. And I, I like how this tradition tells us that we can set up certain organizational structures based on the needs of the fellowship. Mm-hmm. Right, not based on the needs of the director of Sex Addicts Anonymous or the board of trustees of Sex mm-hmm. Addicts Anonymous, but of the voice of the fellowship. Right, so the voice of the fellowship speaks and and says, "Hey, you know what? We we're not really doing much with public information and cooperation with the professional community. Maybe we should create for the first time in in our history since 1977 a committee that focuses on that." Mm-hmm. Okay, so the fellowship spoke and a committee was formed. They've been doing some great work for the last couple of years. You know, again, another example is the fellowship said, you know what, we've been using Alcoholics Anonymous concepts of service since our inception. Maybe we should have our own concepts of service. Uh And so the the voice of fellowship spoke and a committee was formed. And when the need of that committee is is over and done, it'll go away and we don't have that. Right. So, you know, how much organization do we need? Right. It's like how much how much money do we need? How much organization do we need? How much stuff do we need to carry this? this essay message. And I think the answer mm-hmm. is not, not a whole lot, right? We need, we need the minimum, right? Because too much structure, too many committees, too much of that distracts us from what, Ted? Carrying the message to the addict that still suffers. Yeah. Right. Distracts us from that tradition five, right? And, I do, and, you know, I do think about though, the literature committee, how important that is, right? And when we go out to yeah, do, yeah. um, carry that message to counselors and therapists and, and, and churches and institutions, you know, organizations out there that we go meet with, you know, we leave behind um, some handouts, right? Some specific information about our uh, our group, our meetings. And I think that's very helpful. Um, but there is a committee that we have in place to uh, ensure that that literature is, is accurate and sends the right message. Standard, common language, uh, mm-hmm. common look. Yeah. yeah setting up. Setting up uh, subcommittees, just thinking of our inner group, a lot of times mm. we have some very aggressive things that we, we want to tackle over a year. And if we tried to do that at every inner group meeting, we couldn't get other things done. And so one of the things that we were doing over the past few years was migrating from our old website to a new web- website. And instead of bogging down the meeting with making all these decisions, we set up a subcommittee that would report what we recommended. Uh, and I was part of that that subcommittee and recommended things. And we would bring it back to intergroup. So we were able to meet outside of intergroup and then report back to the group and see if uh, it followed along the the thoughts of everyone else and made the adjustments as necessary. Giving thanks is another thing that our group is taking over. It's our annual fundraiser for the ISO. Hmm. And without having a subcommittee to run that, uh, it would bog down inner group as a whole, trying to carry that out. And so getting a few people in charge of working on it and asking for the Hmm. needs that the that they need. And so I love the idea of setting up various committees, whether it's at the local group 
level, the intergroup level, or at the ISO level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's a time and a place for all that stuff. And uh, one of the things I'm reminded of at bottom of 92 and the Green Book, that night tradition protects us from a danger that has threatened human societies throughout history, the abuse of power. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, and in the 12 and 12, it talks really a lot about that as well. Page 173, it says... You know, so the ISO or the Board of Trustees or the humblest group cannot issue a single directive to an SAA member and make it stick, let alone met out any punishment. We've tried it lots of times, but utter failure is always the results. Groups have tried to expel members, right? But the banished have always come back to sit in our meeting place saying, this is a lie for me. You can't keep me out. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a good reminder that, again, we can't tell anyone in SAA really what to do. But at the same time, if you continue reading, it talks about obedience, Right. But what is it obedience to? It's not it's not obedience to this committee or the, the board of trustees per, per se. What what does our life depend on being obedient mm-hmm. to? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Spiritual principles, really. Right. Mm-hmm. The, spiritual principles. Yeah. These, these 12 steps are spiritual principles and either you can obey those or not. And if I don't obey them, good chance I'm not going to stay sober. If I don't stay sober, I'll probably leave anyway. Right. Mm-hmm. And so if I come and I stay. You know, my obedience to these will you know, allow me to have a new life, I think. Yeah, and obedience to my higher power, and um, which yeah. reminds me of, you know, the group conscience, too. And rotating your your trusted servants, your secretary, treasurer, GSRs, you know, that if you're not doing an annual type of election, you know, why not? Do you have enough volunteers, people to step into those roles? Those are important roles. But again, they're not intended to be long-term positions that... Um, um, th- little kingdoms. Uh, that's not the intent of, of trusted servants and uh, rotating those is extremely important. Yeah, you betcha. I'm reminded here what it says in 174, great suffering and great love are SAA's disciplinarians. We need mm. no others. You know, again, SAA doesn't need Darren to tell people what to do, right? SAA doesn't need the board of trustees to tell people what to do, mm. right? Um, my My untreated sex addiction Right. And the suffering that ensues from un- mm. from not treating my disease on a daily basis is the great persuader. Right. It'll, it'll either cause me to go go away or hopefully it'll cause me to come back and start to go. Huh, mm-hmm. Maybe I need to do what the book tells me I need to do in terms of these steps and, and try to seek God and others and help others and all that. Yeah. One of the but, things I was thinking about um, as you were talking about the ISO telling us what to do. One of the things that comes up a lot is the idea of areas and group service representatives and, mm. um, and things like that. We did change the structure of everything. And I like that every group has the chance to have a group service representative, but it's not mandated that they have a a group service representative or that they take part in their area assemblies. But if they want their voice to be heard and the communication to go back and forth between their local meeting, the area assembly and the ISO, that they have that ability to take part in Mm -hmm. that. I have heard people complaining that the ISO is telling us that we need to do this and, and you can take part in it or, or, or not. <laughs> right. Yeah. If I see value in it, I'll take part in it. And mm-hmm. uh, having effective communication helps us to see value sometimes. Um, but yeah. Uh, you know, Ted, you'd mentioned um, demonstration, right? I, I can demonstrate my service. I could demonstrate mm. and put $2 in the hat. Another thing we demonstrate, right, to the folks that we help or even the folks that are just in the room sitting next to us as I can demonstrate my obedience to these spiritual mm. principles, you know, but I'm reminded that I can't force anybody else to, to do that. Right. So uh, I can't make you do it, but I'm going to try to be the best demonstration of a spiritual mm-hmm. way of life, you know, and you'll, you'll either want what I have mm. or you're, you'll run away kicking and screaming because you don't want a thing to do with Darren. Right. You know, so far in 13 years, I've found a bunch of people to help and that's great. My sobriety has been, been great as a result of being useful like that. Uh-huh. Uh, and I think it speaks to being obedient to, again, not these committees, not anybody, one person, but again, to spiritual principles. And again, we have a book, right? The Green Book, the 12 and 12, and the AA yeah, Big Book that have those spiritual uh, directions pretty well laid out. You know, don't have to go too far to find them. 
what else? I know we're kind of getting to the end of our, our hour here. Um, we can run through the common pitfalls. And yeah, see yeah. Else comes up, but um, I wrote down not ro- rotating trusted servants, mm-hmm. not understanding that there are many service opportunities in SAA. Right, we talked about some of that. Um, thinking that we might have authority over other members of the group because of my mm. my service role in the group. Well, I'm the secretary. I'm going to tell yeah. you what to do. No. Mm-hmm. That one came up for me that other people thought that I was asserting my my authority as someone who's been around for a while and mm. you know I host the podcast and various things and therefore I should have a greater say in things and. I, mm-hmm. whenever that comes up, I try to, you know, humble myself and say, no, I'm not saying that I am just, I am exactly the same as everyone else. Right. You know, I'm reminded Jason 173, it says, this doesn't mean that SA won't take advice or suggestions from more experienced members. Mm-hmm. Right. So we, so we want to hear from people that have been around for a while, mm-hmm. but, but, but you, uh, you know, I have to bring a, some humility to that. Mm-hmm my sharing of my experience and I need to get out of I'm right about that. Yeah. You know, and uh, you see that with people that have started groups or you can easily see that with people that have founded groups or founded meetings and or been around 15, 20, 30, 40, right. We need to not put ourselves on a pedestal and others need not put ourselves on pedestals. So. Yeah. Looking at the next pitfall that was written down was not honoring the group conscious decisions mm-hmm. and Sometimes I can get butt hurt when, you know, something that I really think should happen and the group says no. And mm. it's like, oh, I need to honor that and just let my ego move aside and honor the, what the group says. Right. Or is your group even having group conscience mm-hmm. <laughs> meetings? Um, <laughs> you, you know, that's the other thing. If you're not having those, why not? Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah, you bet. Um, that's why we got sponsorship so I can call my sponsor with, you wouldn't believe what they decided to do. <laughs> not communicating needs of the group or not communicating back to the groups. Okay. Yeah. Uh, telling the SAA that the fellowship ought to do something and thus creating a service committee that, but then not supporting that body with service. So yeah, that's mm. a common example. Hey, uh, we need to do this, but yet no one shows up to do the work. Mm, no yeah. volunteers. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, so I, I guess the voice really didn't speak very well, or maybe it wasn't God's will for the fellowship or the group or the committee to be formed. Mm. There's no one. It's one thing to have a, to make a decision or have an idea. It's the most important thing is what happens, what follows that decision. To support it, right? You know, yeah. Does the money show up? Did the, did the servants show up? You know, like there's a motion to have a hybrid conference. Mm-hmm. Recently, and I think, and I think this October. We're going to, for the first time, have a hybrid in-person and Zoom type of conference. But, you know, so the voice of the fellowship said, no, we want a hybrid option. But if the money and the other types of things Mm. don't flow in to make Mm -hmm. that a a viable option, it's like, well, we we agree that we should, but we can't because the money didn't show up. And Mm. so anyway, so hopefully the money shows up and we can we can act on that voice of the fellowship. But yeah, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, look forward to, look forward to uh, see how how we run it this year. Yeah, yeah. At our inner group, we come up with some great ideas, mm. things that we want to carry out. All right, who wants to head that committee? Crickets, S- crickets. <laughs> and so it's like, okay, if we want this to move forward, we really need the, mm. the support behind it. And sometimes it's hard to say no to that. Like, if if I think it's a really good idea and I really want to do it. It's sometimes it's hard for me to not go, I'll do it. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, Cause it's right. being dis- if I don't have the time to commit, cause I'm busy, maybe some other areas, it's kind of dishonest of, mm-hmm. of, of me to, to go, I'll do it. And then I don't have the time. I can't put any of it. And it falls apart. Yeah. Yep. And I happened. feel bad. I feel that's bad. happened to me. Yeah. Right. You know, so we got to be again, spiritual growth can allow me to say, no, I'm not yeah. going to volunteer for that. Even though I think it would be a cool idea. Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, I think we hit seven, eight, and nine pretty good, Jen. Yeah. Yeah. So Thank you. Ne- next time we will be covering 10, 11, and 12. And then uh, any other things that we need to talk about, about the traditions as a whole. And so, yeah, I look forward to doing that in the future. Thanks so much, Jason. Thanks, Thanks Jason. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See ya. Bye. 
Many thanks to Darren and Ted for joining me in on this conversation. And like I mentioned earlier, I'm hoping that the other guys will be able to join us on our final installment of the Tradition Study, where we will be covering Traditions 10, 11, and 12. And most likely that will be at the end of July or the beginning of August. Just thinking of the upcoming episodes, a lot of people have been asking me about episode number 100, if I was going to be doing anything special. And I've been toying with a few different ideas, but I think the one that I've landed on is doing a group discussion, just a general discussion inviting as many people as possible, past guests of the podcast, listeners of the podcast, to join in on a group conversation on Zoom. Uh, No specific topic, just fellowship and reflections of the podcast, uh, other things, but just getting a group of us together and recording and having a fun time. I think that would be a fun thing to do. And I will be posting a link for that Zoom meeting in the announcements page on the BayAreaSAA.org website. In the future, I hope to have a calendar of events on the SexAddictsRecoveryPod.com website. My wife and I, over the past month, started working on the website again, but ran into some other things that we had to take care of. And so once again, it's taken a backseat. But yeah, eventually I'll have a calendar there. Uh, In the meantime, I will be posting on the announcements page on the BayAreaSAA.org website. Date and time yet still to be determined, but it will probably be in the second week of July. So look forward to that. And to close out this episode, I wanted to read a few emails that we've gotten over the past few weeks. And as per usual, I will be abbreviating any names and locations to help keep anonymity. So the first email that I wanted to share, it says, Jason, I just wanted to thank you for this podcast. My restrictions on my phone don't allow me to listen in podcasts, but I can still get it on YouTube. I also attended the noon Zoom meeting and saw you there. It was really nice to put a face to the voice. I can't promise I'll be there every day, but the time slot really works well for most of my schedule, so I plan on attending again. On a side note, I also attend PAA meetings, and that is Porn Addicts Anonymous. Since they don't really have in-person meetings, I attend an SAA meeting here in CS. I don't really differentiate between the two, although I know there's differences. Again, thanks so much for the podcast. It helps me when I feel lonely and just need something recovery-related to fill my head. Thanks, Jay, Recovering Sex and Porn Addict. And you are very welcome, and yeah, I do know a number of people that listen when they need some recovery-related material. And yes, uh, one of the main reasons why we put the podcast onto YouTube is some people had difficulty accessing podcasts or things with their devices blocked. Here's the next one that I wanted to read, and I just got this a few days ago. It says, Hey Jason, my name is B. I'm new to SAA and have yet to attend a meeting. I just wanted to say what a blessing this podcast has been to me. I have been listening to it while working as an overnight trucker. I am currently on episode 65 and started listening less than a month now. Dang, that's awesome. Uh, And it's really been inspiring to me and giving me the courage to attend a meeting soon. Keep up the great work, you and all the guests that have been on. The podcast gives me hope that one day everything will get better for me. And yeah, I hope that too. And yeah, I was really grateful to see both of these guys on at our noon Zoom meeting. And here's the last email that I wanted to read this week. It says, Hello, Jason. I'm happy and astonished that I've discovered this podcast. I'm a recovering COSA and almost know all of the COSA speakers or interviewees of which I'm very grateful to have in my life. This avenue of spreading the message that has been created by you and higher power has been a tremendous gift to me. I was profoundly touched by Sarah B.'s story, as I've also listened to many of the Sex Addicts shares slash podcasts as well. And uh, that is episode number 34. My husband and I have both been affected by compulsive sexual behavior as well as working the SAA and COSA programs respectively. 
We first walked into the rooms in the late 1980s and have been involved at various levels through the years in program. We have both made a concerted re-entry into our programs within the last few months. I will speak for myself and would like to further discuss the eventuality of participating with you on the podcast in the future. I am currently working the nth time of my steps in COSA and feel called to be of service by sharing my story. Like Sarah, I have had family of origin sexual trauma by a Catholic priest slash teacher when I was 13 years old. I have been able to process some of this and other early sexual trauma through my recent years of therapy, and I have recently found the ACSA, Adult Children of Sex Addicts, meetings within our COSA Fellowship. Our second meeting with this focus just started two weeks ago. Through word of mouth with our SA partners and HIR participation, and that is Healthy Intimate Relationships, This meeting is open to other recovery programs as well, such as SAA, where we've had some participation. Therefore, along these lines, would you be open to have some preliminary discussion? I look forward to speaking to you sometime in the future, should you wish to explore what I have shared here. Gratefully, S in California. And yes, absolutely indeed, I would love to have you as a guest on the podcast. I'll also provide some information for the new ACSA meeting, and it says the new second adult children of sex addicts meeting is open to anyone affected by sexual compulsive behavior, including members of other 12-step programs, especially helpful for anyone who identifies as being affected by childhood caregivers or members of your family of origin, or if you're not sure and are exploring whether you may have been affected by compulsive sexual behavior in this way, you're very welcome. And this meeting is on Thursdays at 12 p.m. BST, and that is British summertime. So that is 4 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. U.S. Mountain, and 1 p.m. Pacific. And again, that's on Thursdays. And you can email acsa.cosa2 at gmail.com for further information and i will be providing this information in the show notes as well so anyway i am grateful for all the emails that we've received and if you did wish to leave feedback for the podcast you can always reach out to us and leave a message at feedback at sexaddictsrecoverypod.com Or if you wanted to get a hold of me personally, ask any questions about the program or any questions about the podcast. If you want to be a future guest on the podcast or part of a panel, you can email me at jason at sexaddictsrecoverypod.com. And so with that, I'm going to close out this episode. I am so grateful for everyone listening. And as always, keep coming back. The views and opinions contained in the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the Bay Area Intergroup or the ISO of SAA.